Take your Bible, if you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I've been meaning to preach on unity. And um, God gave me a little side message from that series. I still got a lot left to go on it. I don't know if God's going to end it early or not, but God just kind of pulled my heart and pulled my mind over to uh, a part of Ephesians 4 here. In fact, i tell you what I want to do. While you're there in Ephesians 4, let me read John 17. Let's look at what Jesus said and what his prayer was before he went to the cross. He said in verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And think about relationships that you have in life. Think about marital relationships, family relationships. Families should be as one. The devil does a good job at busting families all to pieces. Okay? And uh, he likes to bust families up, get people hate people and families hate one another. We know one of the signs that we're in the last days is children be turned against their parents, parents be turned against their own children, brothers and sisters hating one another and so on. And we're starting to see, we have been seeing that, but we're starting to see it more and more. This nation is a divided nation. It is a divided nation. And I want this country to be whole. I want it to be uh, a union. We are a, a confederation of states and each state has their own different ideas and different things and different way they do things but I still want America to be a whole and complete nation because that's our strength when it comes to dealing with the rest of this world and dealing with what's going on everywhere in the world our our unity is our strength but I can clearly see the devil destroying this nation by dividing this nation and tearing it apart. And I'm here to tell you that when it comes to, if, I, if I'm to have a choice between a unified nation or standing for what's right, I'm going to stand for what's right if I have to break off from everybody else to do it. Okay? We're given a commandment by our Savior. That we're to love God, and we're to love His kingdom, and we're to love His gospel more than we love father, mother, brother, sister, and things like that. And when anything else comes between you and the Lord, you have chosen a false unity. You have chosen the wrong thing to be a part of. Join in with God's people, amen? And let God make us one. That was the prayer of our Savior. And he said in John 17, verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. They also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. How many of you know and believe in your heart this morning that God loves you? Say amen. amen. That makes us one together. And I, I want God to unify our church. I want God to unify our families together. I want God to, to bring uh, a, a unity and a oneness inside of, of your personal relationships with family, with friends. And the only way to do that, I, I keep bringing this picture up here, and I've had it here for the last two, three weeks I've been preaching on this, is the, the candle, the candlestick that's in the temple. There's seven candles, and uh, last week I think I preached on what these seven candles represent. That there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. There's seven things here that are one together. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. We all believe in the same God. Amen. And I'm not going to be a part of 
the Oprah Winfrey, Joel Osteen crowd that says, oh, we all worship the same God. We just call him Buddha or Mohammed or we call him the nothing or we call him by these other names. I'm not standing with that crowd. I'm not part of that. If that's the unity they want, they can have it. I'll unite with the others that believe that there's one God. Amen. amen. And I know what his name is. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. His name, well, here we go. His name is the Word of God. Because on that menorah, see, there's seven candlesticks there. And it could represent, there's seven candlesticks, and yet they all bring out one light inside the tabernacle. There's one light, even though there's seven candles there. So one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. So there's seven things there. It also represents, according to Revelation, it also represents the seven spirits of God. In, in Isaiah chapter 11, he denotes the seven spirits of God. And yet there's seven, and yet there's one complete spirit that is in each one of us, and God doesn't just give one a spirit of wisdom and then another a spirit of knowledge. God says we can have it all in the Spirit. Amen. And one of the things that I... And, and a dear sweet saint pointed this out to me here a couple years ago. And I just... Man, I, I wanted to shout when I saw this. God told Moses that when you make this candlestick, put seven candles in it, and I want you to decorate it so it's going to look like a tree. And it's going to look like an almond tree. And on this, on each branch of this tree, of this candlestick, I want you to put some, I want you to put a, a knob, a bud, and a flower. I want you to decorate it. And I want three of those knob, flower, and buds on each one of those branches. So there's three on the three, three left side, three on the three right side branches. And the total number of decorations, when you add the one in the middle, there's 22 sets, but if you add it all up, there's 66 decorations on that candlestick. And there are 66 books in your Bible. And God, is show, God showed us thousands of years ago that the light that He's going to shine in our hearts was going to be through His Word with 66 books in it. Now, you may one day, you may be reading Obadiah, you may be reading Matthew another day, you may read Genesis one day, you may read Revelation another day, but I'm going to tell you what, this whole Bible is for all of us, it is all for you, God fills us with these great and precious promises, and it doesn't matter if you read Old Testament one day, New Testament another day, it is the same Spirit, the same light that goes into each one of us, and I'm pretty sure that all of us here are surrounded around one Bible, the King James Version, 1611. Amen. I thought maybe I'd get somebody to shout, maybe just once. Or a, woohoo! Okay, that'll work. See, God sent weird people in this place. Amen. What makes us one is that we sit down, we read out of the same Bible, and God's making us think the same way. Because we believe what we're reading in here. We went through this in Sunday school. Some say there's mistakes in the Bible. I got a rule that says there are no mistakes in the Bible. Amen? Amen? Zero mistakes. When I read it, it is the Word of God. It is undefiled. It is incorruptible. It is exactly what God wants us, wants us to know, wants us to believe, wants us to read, wants us to meditate on, wants, wants us to share with others so that they can believe as well, so that they can be part of what God has given us here. And yet, there are differences in everybody here. And this is what I'm going to talk about this morning. Because while we're all one, one church, one body, with one head, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, I guess I'm the Adam's apple of the head. I'm like between the head and the body. That, that little thing that wiggles up and down when it talks, right? Okay? But some days, some of us need a little bit more than others. A little bit more of what? Well, he says it here in this passage. Verse 6, one God, let me put it up on the screen here. 
one, one God, let me back up here, come on. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And then he says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Some this week, some people in this church, some people online this week need a lot more grace than others this week. We was notified of two, three deaths. Was it two or three? Two. Two families. How many? Three, four, maybe, I don't know. We've been notified of people whose family members have died. Donna, our soft, I call her software lady. Her dad died. She'd been praying for her dad for a long time. And unless I'm mistaken, he has entered into eternity without Jesus Christ. That's hard. Especially when we know what we know. I have not had anybody in my family die this week. So I don't need that double or triple portion of grace that she's going to need this week. And when we pray, we're praying for her that God would give her the grace that she needs that will sustain her as she looks at her daddy in his coffin this week. She's going to need a lot more grace than you and I have. You see that? Now, that's not supposed to make anybody jealous because somebody got more than somebody else did. Because the one who knows what everybody needs is the Lord Jesus. And he said that he is giving every one of us grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What does Donna, whose dad has died, what does Donna need to do or perform in order to get the grace that she's going to need this week? Not a thing. When somebody dies that you love, even I've been in the ministry for years dealing with death and almost without fail I never know exactly what to say to somebody when that happens I don't have the words and there are just things that we cannot do when this kind of tragedy happens so if God made this big requirement of what we had to perform and what tricks we had to do or maybe how much money we had to give or whatever the sad thing would be we wouldn't be getting the grace that we needed to get through that and after a while to be honest we probably wouldn't serve God anymore we get it for free from the one who gives it who knows what every body really needs. And he does know more than you do that about what you need, about what somebody else needs. He knows that. Amen? I'm going to show you something in a minute. I want to pray. But I'm going to show you this morning. I, I was sent a video uh, last night, and I thought, man, I've got I to gotta, I gotta include this in here somehow, some way. It just made me mad. It, it is why the Jews are still lost to this day. But let's go to the Lord and pray, and you pray for me this morning that I know how to preach this message, all right? Heavenly Father, I come to you today, Lord, and I thank you, dear God, for the word that you've given me. Lord, the verses are there. They're going to say what they're going to say. But Father, I just don't know how to preach it. So I'm asking, Lord Jesus, for you to come and for you to open this book. Open it up and make known unto your people today what it is that you have to say to them. I'm not qualified. I'm not the one that can do that. And so, Jesus, would you come into this place, 
visiting all of us here, visiting with those that are watching online or those who will watch this maybe in the weeks to come. God, that you would bless people, Lord, who need, who need a lot of grace. Those who might need more than others. Those, Lord, who might need more sins forgiven than others need. And yet, at the end of the day, they are all forgiven of their sin. So, Father, help us, Lord, to listen. Help us, Lord, to pay attention. Help us, dear God, to, uh, to allow the Spirit to talk to us, to deal with us today, and to show us what you would have us to know. Help me to preach it. And, Father, I pray for the Jew. I pray for Israel. Pray for your people, because they are very lost, and they're very, very, very far away from knowing the truth. But one of these days, you're going to open up their eyes. You're going to breathe life into them again, and they're going to live, and they're going to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Lord and the Savior. And I just pray, dear God, this man that I'm going to talk about this morning, he needs to be saved. He doesn't understand. And I pray, dear God, that you would... He's read your word, and he doesn't believe it. And I pray that you'd help him this morning. Bless us this morning. Help us, dear God, as we listen to the word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Now, a guy sent me a, an email last night, and he said, Pastor, you need to watch this. And it was a Jewish rabbi. He's got a website called Jews for Judaism. And instead of promoting, you know, like some Jews get saved and they have Jews for Jesus, this Jew is promoting Judaism. It's promoting the Jewish way and the Jewish religion and the Jewish Torah and everything that's Jewish. And he, he's read the New Testament and he wants no part of Bible Christianity. Does not believe that Jesus is his Messiah. And what the, the deal was about, uh, he was describing Satan. And I'm going to tell you something. I won't, I won't get into what he said about Satan. If I told you, your head would explode. What, he, what this Jewish man, what they believe about Satan, it'll just blow your mind. But then he started talking about salvation. And he started talking about grace. And this really got me, I mean, it got me going. And I'm going to put it up on the screen Number one, he said, there, he said, he, Satan, is clearly subordinate to God, a member of his suite, who is unable to act without his permission. Nowhere is he, in any sense, a rival of God. What this man did is he put Satan up in a, and he called him good. This Jewish rabbi, this lost man, who God gave the oracles to, reads it and says that God is saying of Satan that Satan is good. That man's lost. But here's what he said about grace. He said we have to work to earn our place in the world to come. We don't get it as a free gift. This is why they are not saved. This is why they're lost. And to be honest with you, this is why probably 60, 70, 80% of most church people are sitting in church views this morning and are going to die and go to hell, is that in some way, in some fashion, they themselves believe that heaven is a place to be earned by good works and good deeds rather than it being a gift of God and that we cannot earn it. Amen. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot earn God's grace. That's what he said. But and every one of us is given grace according to the measure. I want you to focus on that word measure. The measure of the gift of Christ. Who in here has ever sat open presence with brothers, sisters, and cousins and got mad and jealous because you opened your present and it wasn't as good as somebody else's present? Raise your hand, you liars. <laughs> Take a look up on the screen. There are different measures. Different recipes that need, have different requirements of things. 
different things that we eat need some more of this or less of that. Maybe some people like their food really spicy. Who's our spice people? Who likes it really spicy? Who's our bland, white, pasty, eat it bland type people? They don't want to admit it. Okay? But in that sense, everybody's different. Some, this is why they put salt and pepper shakers on the table so that everybody can salt their food the way they like it. Everybody can pepper their food the way they like it. And I sat down at a Chinese restaurant one time years ago, and the waitress lady, she, she, was, she chewed me out because she brought out my dish, and immediately I started pouring soy, soy sauce on it. And she said, oh, no, stop, too, too salty, too salty. And I went, leave me alone. I'm American, I'm going to eat this American way. Now take a look at this. Mama, mama in a traditional family, she's the one dishing out the plates. Mama always knew that daddy wanted more of this and needed more of that than Johnny and Sally did. Johnny and Sally didn't get as much as daddy did. Mama sometimes didn't eat as much as the rest of the family did, but she always knew who needed how much of what. And when she prepared the meal, she prepared it with those people in mind. Now, think about this family eating this food. Or, to put it in terms we understand better, think of, every, think of let's, a whole group of us after church maybe, let's say let's go to the Chinese buffet. Amen? Sound good? Okay. Now, at a buffet, they lay it all out there, and you can get as much as you want. Okay? As big as your stomach is, that's how much you can put in there. And they don't yell at you and throw stuff at you if you keep going up three or four times. Okay? It's a buffet. You pay the price, you get the food. Some people need more than others to get full. But, by the time everybody's done... When we get up from the table, everybody should be what? Full. You understand that, right? Okay. I had surgery so that when I go to the buffet, I can only eat like this much, and then I'm full. And sometimes I'm mad then that I had surgery. Because I wanted, because I, and then I remember why I had the surgery. And then I'm, I'm fine with it. Let me get to my point here. Let me read some. I'm going to read some of these real quick. This is about God's mercy. Now I want you to think about this. And think about the church you're sitting in. Because in the church you're sitting in, I know some of you people, I've known you for a long time. you know known me for a long time. And the ones that have come in, I'm learning you. And I know that sometimes some of you need two or three more visits to the buffet when it comes to God's grace and God's mercy. And some of you, well, just one plate full is going to do enough. And I think what I'm trying to say is, it's really none of our business or we should not care that somebody in this church needed a lot more of God's mercy this week than other people in this church needed God's mercy. Because some people... Every now, you know I believe in cycles. We go in cycles. Sometimes we're good and sometimes we're not good. And it just kind of keeps rolling around. So there may be about half of you that had a pretty good week this week and you feel on top of the world and you feel like God's answering all your prayers and you feel satisfied and everything's good. You want any, do you need any more grace? No, God, I think I got, I got quite enough. Thank you, I think I'm doing pretty good. Which usually or sometimes leads to when we have enough, sometimes 
we think that's going to hold us a lot longer than it usually does. And then we start not reading our Bible and not praying and not trying to live the life that we're supposed to live. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves needing, we're starving for grace and we're starving for mercy and we need a lot more than we did last week. Am I making sense to everybody? What I don't think we ought to do is look down at some people who are going through the roughest time, things that you probably cannot imagine. They're going through it, and they're not doing well, and you are. And instead of looking down at them, because they just need a lot of grace and a lot of free help in their life, because they can't help themselves. I can't. And you can't. Some of you sitting here this morning, I know what's going on. And I'm telling you, you cannot help yourself. You can't do it. Grace is that free gift that God gives us, sustains us through all the storms of life that we are in. Do we believe that? Do we believe what God told Paul? My grace is sufficient to fill every need in your life, to deal with every thorn in your flesh that you have to deal with. My grace really is sufficient. I want you to take a look at what God said about His mercy. Psalm 5, 7, But as for me, I will come into my, in thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. Look at that. How is it that you made it here today? God's mercy. Who deserves to be here? Not a one. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord mercy shall compass him about. You know what a compass does? Draws a what? A circle. A circle is complete. If it's not complete, it's not a circle. God said His mercy will compass Him about, and whether it's a big circle or a little circle, it's still a circle. And if God said that He was going to cover you completely, then He covers you completely. We don't believe what the Roman Catholic Church believes is that Christ died for most of your sins, but you've got to pay the rest of the bill. We don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that when God covers somebody's sins, He covers them all the way and encompasses them completely with His mercy because He has enough. <clears throat> Psalm 36, 5, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in, the he is in the heavens, and Thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. How far is God's throne from this church right here? How far is it? To the end of the universe... Even with Hubble telescope, we can't even see the end of the universe. And it's beyond that. How high is that? It's, I, can't even, I can't even fathom it. How, how much mercy then, if, if it stacked up from here to heaven, how much would that be? Do you think, do you think there is enough mercy to cover my wife's sins, my son's sins, and my sins all together? Let's hope so. Then do you think there's enough left over for the rest of you? So what does it matter if somebody needs a lot of God's mercy and you don't need it? What, are you afraid that if they take more that you won't get any? No. Because from here to heaven, it's stacked up all the way to the heavens. And I think God's got enough. Psalm 86, 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. How much does it say that he has? Plenty. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. See, there he said it again. Psalm 100. For the Lord is good. His mercy is how far? Everlasting. Does that mean that if I sin... And I ask God to forgive me, and He forgives me. 
If I do the same sin again, does he run out of forgiveness because I did it again? Because who among us has not done it again? We've all done it. And done it again. And done it again. And the Lord's mercy is everlasting. Which means that He's never going to stop forgiving you while you never stop going to Him. You see, I believe in salvation, and I believe salvation is forever, but I believe somebody that's really saved has a real problem that when they sin, they can't hang on to it. They've got to let God have it every time. I'm not one of these that believe that you can just hang on to sin and keep it, and keep doing it, doing it, doing it, not ever ask forgiveness. Not, that's not the sign of someone that's saved. That's the sign of someone who's a reprobate, and is playing church, and they're not forgiven, and they probably never will be, because they keep getting away with what they're doing. So, different story. Psalm 101, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that what? Fear Him. Psalm 103, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto children's children. Everlasting is this way in the past, and to everlasting is this way in the future. So when, Scotty, when God, when you went to God and said, God, will you forgive me? God smiled, you just smiled a while ago because I think you get it. God smiled and said, I already did, but thanks for asking. Amen? It's from everlasting knowing that God, when He elected you, already knew what He was getting when He elected you. It was no mystery to God what you would do after you got saved. God already knew it, and He elected you anyway. And if God wasn't willing to continue loving you and having mercy on you and giving you grace, He would have never selected you. God's willing. Amen? Here's, here's my favorite thing here. Psalm 106. Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for His good, His mercy endureth how long? Now, turn to Psalm 136. Turn to Psalm 136 in your Bible. Yes, you got to get a Bible out. Get your Bible out. Turn to Psalm 136. If you take too long, that's your lunch time. I want you to circle that Psalm 136 because it's special. It's unique. Because remember, these are songs that the children of Israel sang, that David wrote and others wrote. And so songs sometimes have a little bit of, a little bit of repetition in them. Not bad repetition, but just a little bit. And I want you to read verse 1 and read verse 2 and read verse 3, and you see a pattern here. Every verse ends with what? His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. You can hear the pattern in the, in the music in it. His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. You can make up the, the other music, Matthew, if you want to, for the first part of it. But the last part's always going to go, His mercy endures forever. That was pretty good. I just made that up just now. 26 times. How many letters are there in the English alphabet? That means from A to Z, you pick a sin that has got the letter A on it, God will forgive it. Pick a sin with the letter Z. I don't know if there's any sin with Z on it. But God will forgive it from A to Z. His mercy endures forever. Now, there's a point to all this. I'm going to get to it in a little bit. So hang with me. Leviticus 19. See... There are, I want you to look at this. In fact, open your Bible up, Leviticus 19. I want you to look at this, underline this in your Bible. I preached a message on this here a while back, and it was, uh, God really showed me some things I never really thought of before. God 
laid it down several times in this Bible that measurements and weights and rulers like yardsticks and weights they would put on a scale and cups or bags or baskets that hold certain amounts of material. Those things matter to God. I never really thought about that, but I don't know how many times God put it in the Bible, you're not to have a false balance. You're not to tip the scales in your favor, that everything has to be equal. God said a false balance is an abomination to me. And here's what the sinner will do. The sinner who doesn't want Christ, he's got all of his sins pushing down on a balance, weighing it down. And what he likes to do is he's got this in his mind that, oh, my righteous deeds are going to outweigh my sinful deeds. And when God sees that, then uh, he'll let me go to heaven. He doesn't understand that his, he's got a false balance and that his bad deeds, there is no good deeds. His good deeds are as filthy rags. They'll never outweigh his bad deeds. So what he does, the lost man tips the scale so that he is as good or better than he really is, and he thinks he's going to heaven and not. And God says, that's an abomination. Now watch this. Leviticus 19.35, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment in meat yard, like, uh, like the metric or meter, in weight or in measure. That means when you get on the scale tomorrow morning, it's telling you the truth. Whether you like it or not. You shall do no unrighteousness, watch this, in judgment. In judgment. No unrighteousness in judgment. Now here's, here's what I'm going to get to. Matthew 6, 12 says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now watch this. Let's say that, let's say that um, Mike borrowed uh, from, from me $10,000. Okay? You want to pay it back? And let's say Phil borrowed from me $100. You want to pay it back? Okay. So both these guys end up being deadbeats. They're not... They both lost their jobs, lost their houses, lost everything they had. They don't have two nickels to rub together. The economy crashed. We're in a depression. There's no work, nothing anywhere. And now these guys cannot pay their bill. And so I come to a place where I realize Phil's not going to pay it. Mike's not going to pay it. I love these guys. They're my friends. So I think about it for a while and I say, you know what? Rather than having a debt, I'll just forgive the debt. So I forgive Mike's debt, $10,000. And I forgive Phil's debt, $100. Now, what is the difference between these two men in my sight? Nothing. Nothing. Because I forgave both of their debts and I don't hold it against either one of them and never will for eternity I'll never hold it against either one of them and when both of these guys die I debt free do you see how that is they're both equal because in my sight their debt has been paid now, when Jesus sees us, when he stands before Almighty God as our advocate, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the what? Righteous, the Bible says, which means that Jesus never sinned. And when I stand before God in judgment, Jesus then says to the Father, his sins been forgiven, all of them. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. And then when my son Matthew stands before God in judgment, Jesus says of him, 
His sins are forgiven. There are no sins. His debt is free. God, enter into the joys of the Lord. Well done, thou good faithful servant. Does it ever come up how much he's been forgiven versus what I've been forgiven? No, it never comes up. God never says, well, how much did Mike get forgiven? Well, how much did Matthew get forgiven? Well, that's important because, see, I've got a Shangri-La place here in heaven for the people that didn't, didn't owe much. And then I've got a dirt pile over here for the people that had a lot forgiven. And that's what they're going to get. That's a lie. That's a joke. That's not God. And I would not serve a God that... Luke 11, 4 said, and forgive us of our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Hang on, let me catch my breath. Divers' weights and divers' measures, both of them, are alike an abomination to the Lord. So here's what I'm saying. God's got a scale, and he's taken, who else can I pick on? Justin. Big guy. He's got Justin's sins over here. Christ has taken his sins upon himself, so now the scales are even. Amen? Your debt's been paid. Okay? God has forgiven every sin that Justin has ever committed. You knew Justin for the last 20 years. And one of the sins that Justin committed was against you. And you decided not to forgive him. So what happens is, you've got a different scale and a different measurement than God has. God's forgiven everything. But you decided that you weren't going to forgive something that he did. And you were going to hold it against him. For a long, long, long time. You have what God calls an abomination. Because God has wiped away all of his debt and you refuse. So now watch this. Guess what? Guess what God says? The same judgment that you used against Justin is the same one that I'm going to use against You won't forgive, I won't forgive you. Am I right in saying that? Twice in your Bible. Matthew 6, 12, Luke 11, 4. What are you holding against somebody? What are you not forgiving somebody that God has already forgiven them of? You know, you're going to carry that for the rest of your life. Instead of having an empty scale where you forgive them of everything and you're now carrying the burden, now you're carrying the debt of unforgiveness. Am I preaching right? Amen. Matthew 7, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. This Bible's right. Mark 4, 24, and he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall, be, shall more be given. Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And what he's doing is, you, you know the difference between somebody dumping goods in a basket and they just put them in there, but there's a lot of airspace in there. So this basket may weigh four pounds. And that's what you give to somebody. But God has given you a basket where he poured it in, shook it, tamped it down, found out there was this much more space to the top, and then poured more in for you. Amen. And you've got more than what you were willing to give to somebody else. You're crooked. You're crooked. And you're a thief because God has given you more than what you're willing to give to somebody else. 
His Bible's right. Am I keeping you long? Here's the alternative. Isaiah 65, 7. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. Jeremiah 51, 13. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant treasures, thine end has come, and the measure of thy covetousness. So that's the alternative. Your lust, you know what covetous is? It's lust. It's what you, it's covetousness is the sin that your brain commits, not your body. It's the one that your brain commits that nobody knows about. Covetousness is the one that you can get away with nearly all the time. Because everybody says, what are you thinking? Oh, nothing. You liar. You're going to get that back to you one of these days. And God is going to hold every one of them and hold you accountable for them. So while you, listen to me because I'm going to finish it. While you can look at others and say to them, look at what they have done. They did that thing. They may have done it once or twice and you say, that was bad. And you hold that against them. You, in your mind, did it 40 times a day. Same thing. You thought about it. You looked upon it. You lusted after it. You coveted it. And nobody knew. And you did it 40, 100 times a day. Holding this against them while you think you're getting away scot-free. And it, God says it doesn't work that way. Your covetousness, God knows every one of them. He knows everything you looked at, everything you thought about, everything you lusted after, everything, every place your mind went that was unholy and unrighteous before God, God wrote them all down. You can say that you're better than somebody else because of what you didn't do that they did, but what about what you thought? There's a big pile of it. You've got an unrighteous balance. God's going to hold it against you. You think about this. I don't know how to finish this. Is there another verse? God says, I'll correct thee in measure. That means, how bad was your sin? God knows it, and that's how many swipes with the rod God will give you. Amen? If you think you sin a little, that's fine. God's still going to get you. Amen? Don't worry about somebody else. If they sin a lot, don't worry about it. God's got a rod for them, and He's going to correct them in name. Amen? He's going to get them. Oh, listen, I'm going to let you go, but I want you to bow your heads for a minute. I want you to pray, and I want you to think about it. This deal about measure. Number one, how many sins are you holding back from God? That's the first question I'm going to ask you, and I don't want you to answer it. I want you to think about it in your mind, in your heart. How many sins are you holding back away from God? Number two, how many sins are you holding against somebody else? Now, to you... God has given you the amount of grace and mercy that you've needed every single day that you've needed it. Sometimes you didn't need as much. Sometimes you needed more. But then there's always somebody that you need to forgive and won't. And God says you have an unjust balance. A false balance. And if you dare say in your mind that earth it, then you forgot what grace really was. Grace was getting what you didn't deserve. Grace is you being in church this morning. Grace is you still believing the Bible. Paul walked away from it. And God withdrew his mercy from him. Grace is you still having your sin forgiven for eternity. Never to come back on you. 
and you didn't deserve it. That's grace. I know there's people out there that have done some pretty rotten things to you. I get it. I understand it. There's a season to be angry. But then there comes a season to forgive. So just think about who you haven't forgiven. And ask God to bring upon you a season where you finally can. I know it takes time. Usually does with me. Heavenly Father, come before you this morning, Lord, and I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord, for them long-suffering with the long-winded preacher. Listening to the Word of God, speak to them. Lord, I did not have anybody in mind preaching this. This is what you told me to preach. But I'm pretty sure, God, that you have somebody in mind, and I don't know who it is and don't need to know. But, God, you've dealt with somebody. If it was just one out of 10,000, Lord, then so be it. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would lift in some hearts the burden of a false balance, the burden, forgiveness, the burden, dear God, of carrying around envy or spite towards someone, waiting to catch them, waiting to punish or torment them. God, remove from them that burden. God, thank you for having mercy on us. And God, whatever mercy you had on us this week, we may need that much or more next week. And Father, we thank you that you really do have plenty of mercy. Amen. We thank you for that, God. We ask that you help us as your children. Chasten us as you will. Love us, God, and help us, Lord, to love one another. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Stand up if God spoke to you today. See, that's one way to get you to stand up. God bless you. Thank you for coming. We appreciate our visitors come. And uh, we want you to come back and, and be welcome. All right? You make them welcome this morning. And if you said to them, they're going to come tell me.